thanks a lot for the introduction. It is a great honor uh, to be invited here and to moderate uh, this uh, discussion uh, with uh, our experts uh, who will provide uh, uh, proper answers uh, for uh, my questions. I will suggest to discuss uh, the problems of uh, rebuilding, uh, reconstruction and uh, reconciliation of Ukraine uh, from the different perspectives of um, politics, uh, economy, uh, society, uh, culture and, uh, and memory politics. And uh, I said just to start uh, with, with uh, politics. Um, Timothy Snyder and, and Jason Stanley uh, recommended uh, to frame uh, this war uh, uh, about uh, the war uh, between uh, the Western values, uh, the liberal democracies, uh, the open societies, and uh, the Eastern oppressors, the illiberal tendencies. I sympathize uh, with this interpretation and uh, I uh, absolutely agree uh, with, this, with this narrative that uh, uh, this uh, war uh, is not local, but uh, uh, this war uh, has a, a universal meaning. But <clears throat> according to the historical experience, Wars always uh, strengthen illiberal tendencies and anti-democratic tendencies in uh, fighting countries. For instance, <clears throat> war, uh, wars in fighting countries empowers, empower uh, the so-called strongmen. For instance, uh, military generals who have uh, political ambitions and uh, strongmen strong men who, who endanger uh, democracies. And that's why I would like to ask, uh, what uh, do you see the most important challenges uh, to the Ukrainian democracies in the future after uh, hopefully victorious war, apart from uh, the Russian imperialism, of course? Who will start? <laughs> Thank you so much. And uh, first of all, thank you so much for inviting and having two parallel sessions devoted to Ukraine. Um, so I, I would say we start not hopefully victorious war, but certainly a victorious war. And I do believe that will be a victory no matter what happens and no matter what kind of a speech Putin gives today or any, uh, any other morning. Because, I mean, this is what lots of Ukrainians are living on right now and how we are going through over the last seven months. It's almost seven months, I must say, because if there is no hope about victory, then what do we do? Um, uh, I must say, like, there will be lots of challenges no matter what happens, because what we see at the moment, like, people do want a victory. They want to keep the independent state. They want to keep the democratic values. This is, and literally to remain Ukrainians and not uh, to fulfill, like not to follow the ideas what Putin is saying that this the state never existed. The state existed and the Ukraine as a state has, was, has been and will be still. And that's the reason, first of all, it's essential to say that the identity of Ukrainians remain and it will be further foster and like we as a state uh, function uh, further on. And that's the reason what we fight for, that there is a state that we live in. That's one thing. Another thing is about democratic institutions and processes. Indeed, the huge transformation has been going on over the last year since the revolution of dignity. But what, why it's happening? Because if people are unhappy, they go out on the streets. That's how democracy functions. And if we call Ukraine to be a democratic state or even more democratic state, I mean, we have revolutions. If people are unhappy with uh, dictatorship, totalitarian or anything, I mean, simple example, in Kyiv, you could follow over the last year or a year ago, lots of urban development activists going out on the streets and not being afraid that some they will be imprisoned because they are against of some illegal uh, development. Because people go out on the streets, they feel that they need, there is this space for democracy and acting. We see also the fact like how different ideas, startups and projects are coming up. 
So this is once again this fulfillment that we want this democratic state to exist. But what the challenge is and what we must understand is the level of damage that is taking place. On the one hand, we talk about physical damage, about the cities that are ruined, about the houses that, they are, that are destroyed, that people don't have homes to, in a big uh, scale of the countries. I have like some of the numbers so we have every uh, months or every second month there is an assessment of the scale of the damage. So approximately there is 131,000 houses destroyed. I mean that's a lot. These are civilian houses and it's also like 900 hospitals. This is all infrastructure. This is hard infrastructure and these are the cities where this infrastructure does not exist or is heavily damaged or uh, destroyed. I mean, we differentiate now between damage and destruction, but this is what the cities face. And this is this, like, consequences that will be of this war. How do we rebuild? And the uh, uh, World Bank is assessing that uh, the cost of recovery and reconstruction will be something like 300 billion. That's the recent, a recent assessment that has been published. I mean, in Lugana Recovery Conference, we talked about some 100 billion cost of what has been damaged. I mean, this is what we will face when we will win, that we will have to rebuild, that people return, and it's safe to live there. It's, it's the hard side of, uh, of what's happening. Another thing is a trauma. I mean, you are, we are witnessing what's happening all around, like people, people are dying, and these are not average people. I mean, like, this is uh, human life. We have cases, how many cases of torture we hear every day about, how many cases of rape, violence, I mean, recent case of Izum, just imagine Izum, Balaklia, these were just a regular cities that could be anywhere here in Hungary, in Poland, in Belgium, wherever. This is just a typical city, but it's almost in the dust. And like, you have hundreds of graves there. And people, these were just regular people like us. And this is like the cities do not exist in, in, in the end of the day. And we will have to cope with this in future that uh, there is a huge also psychological trauma coming of this, whether you will be any anytime ready to return to these cities if you know what happened there. And why it happened? Because of some ambitions, sick ambitions of the neighbor or whatever. So we see like we have on the one hand like this desire for democratic transformation, but further development and, and heading in that direction. But on the other hand, we will have to bear the consequences of the hard scale, da hard damages, like hard infrastructure damages, and also of a, like a human cost of all this. Disrupted education process, disrupted health care. I mean, today we talked a lot about, I mean, we talk about uh, Putin's speech day uh, everywhere. But these are four regions, and also the, there are civilians who are remaining there, and we don't know whether they, they can breathe, or they are already in some torture uh, chambers under police stations, whether they have an access to medical resources, or they will literally have, will die because they don't have where to get their painkiller or whatever else. And this is the reality, and we will have to face this reality long ago, and these consequences of this reality will be quite pain painful for all of us. And it's not local what I would like to underline. The things that we observe on the news and everywhere, it's not just the case of Kherson or Chernihiv or Balaklia, Izum, whatever city. This is something what all of us feel beyond the borders of Ukraine. And this, this will be the cost for all of us, the longer it drags. And also like how to cope with this, how to, how to cope with this in future, and what an impact it will be on the discussion of democracy in future. So Sofia has shown that this is no simple answer to, to, to your question. So let's begin with your uh, beginning statement about the war between uh, democracy and authoritarian. So I do believe in this, uh, in this statement, so, but uh, the question is, do we really mean this, uh, this, this stake of, of, of the war here in the Western uh, uh, countries? Because the question, of course, is about Ukraine after the war, but it, this is also the question about democracy in the Western world after the war, even if, if it will be won by Ukrainians and by, let's say, democratic 
supporters of, of Ukraine. Because it's not so obvious. We, you referred to, to Timothy Snyder, and, and, uh, but we can also read another uh, great text in the last issue of, of The Atlantic, George Parker. Um, left the United States and he went to, to Ukraine to write uh, what's going on uh, there. But what, he, but what he writes, that he was leaving the USA with deep sorrow for his country because the, the US, so he's uh, the cradle of democracy, we could say, is on the brink of the uh, civil war, yes, or at least collapse of democratic processes. So we can see this now. So uh, he wrote that he uh, was leaving to Ukraine uh, with hope to watch a new meaning, new, so let's say, resources for rebuilding democracy. And he, in this way, he is uh, with agreement with Natalia Humenyuk, a brilliant uh, Ukrainian uh, journalist who wrote that the war in Ukraine is strengthening democracy. And he wrote all, she wrote this also. Uh, uh, she, she, she has written this, this text also in uh, The Atlantic, so, so it's, it's important. But uh, I was uh, observing what's going on in Ukraine for, I was, I, I've been watching what's going on in Ukraine for, for many years, and uh, I was also, I had this pleasure to be in, participate in the revolution of dignity and, and uh, watching what was going on there. And, 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 uh, uh, my first feeling was that it was kind of a universal moment, that, that Ukrainians uh, showed themselves as kind of a universal revolutionary nation, that it's not about local issue, that it was a revolution about universal value of, of uh, I would say, enlightenment value of, of uh, critical mind who is against authoritarian rule and so on. So it, it's nicely developed by, by French philosopher Marc Crepon, who uh, talked about this in... in uh, How, why this is so. So, and I believe that, that uh, this can be this, that this hypothesis of, of, of universal fight for of Ukraine and for, for democracy is quite, quite, quite uh, uh, good. And uh, saying this, we have to um, acknowledge that Ukrainians are doing against the rule book, at least since the revolution of dignity. Because at that time, after and that time, after the revolution, the, uh, the Russian aggression began. So we must remember the war began eight years ago, not just half a year ago. Half a year ago. And after that, of course, because of the pressure of, of Ukrainians, the economy almost collapsed in 2014. So, and in these circumstances, with very weak economy, Ukrainians have been consolidating their democratic system. They managed to do crucial or essential reforms like decentralization, giving and decentralization power to local communities, which was very successful. And then part of the answer to this war, part of the, the let's say, sources of power during this, this war. So they managed to do this, and uh, they managed to consolidate uh, civic society, which is very strong now in, the, in Ukraine. But what's important? civic society was involved in reforming and, and uh, or basic institutions of Ukrainian life, like army, this uh, popular army, in the direct meaning of this word. It's not state army. So because of many, not only voluntary uh, soldiers being involved, but also nowadays we can see there are all strata of the society is involved. Women, LGBT, anarchists, even anarchists enrolled to, 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 to the army to fight for the republic. So it's, it's, it's something, something really fresh. And of course, there are questions about the future, and, and Ukrainians are asking them themselves. So President uh, Zelensky uh, had his speech about Ukraine as a great Israel. It was in April, I believe, uh, talking about the future. No, Ukraine democracy will have to be militarized. It's obvious because of the neighbor which will exist nevertheless of the result of this war. So the militarization will be the fact. So the question is about democracy inside the militarized country. But the problem is that we are also being militarized. So Poland is now one of the biggest spender of money on, on the military stuff, yes, because 
we believe that this war is also our war. Yes, and uh, Russia is not only the enemy and direct threat to Ukraine, but also to us and to other countries which are our neighbors, like Lithuania and so on. So we are spending a lot. And uh, of course, we can see that this is the threat for, for, for democratic process. So we will have to find answers, but I think that many answers for these problems we will see in Ukraine and we can not, so we should reframe our minds from this uh, usual direction that we are in a position to transfer the knowledge how to build a democratic society, but, and then we should let's establish symmetric relations. How can we learn from Ukrainian experience to rebuild our democratic laws in Poland and or in Hungary is quite an important question uh, nowadays. So, and the, the last issue, so uh, in my organization we, uh, we've been involved, uh, involved in, in dialogue with Ukraine since the, since the moment of independence of Ukraine. We were uh, trying to, 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 to build kind of a platform to exchange of ideas and so on. And since the beginning of the war, uh, we came to the conclusion that the best way to talk uh, and to present what's going on is to give the floor to Ukrainians themselves. So we began a cycle of, of debates called uh, Ukraine Speaks, and we are inviting Ukrainian experts to explain us what's going on there. Last week we had a meeting with uh, Ukrainian sociologists who are studying what's going on inside Ukrainian society during the war. The, the, the brightest one, like Riefen Hovacha or Natalia Czernish, so, so really brilliant sociologists. And they try to explain that there is a very interesting process of consolidation of political nations around state institutions, but not under the, let's say, state institutions, but around. And what it means that Ukrainians believe in victory and don't accept any let's say, compromises and, and, uh, and uh, let's say, bargaining uh, in terms of territory and so on. So even if the state would try to, to do this kind of bargaining, as it tried in April, it wouldn't be accepted. So it, they will continue the fight without the state. This is the, 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 the answer. So this is the highest, I would say, let's say, expression of democracy perhaps anarchic, anarchistic one, a little way, but on the other side, it means that, that they believe that the republic is there, that state is part of the republic, not, but not the whole republic. And uh, the republic is about democracy in this way. So it's my interpretation of what's going on. Just briefly to add to your last point, it's 90% something like that, uh that of Ukrainians who will not uh, agree to any concessions. I mean, like we have these sociological surveys uh, every couple of weeks now, and it's like the number is like EU and NATO support is something 80 above, and n disagreeing, like not supporting any kind of a consensus, like Ukraine should stay as, as a state as it is, is like 90%. So there's like, I've never observed such kind of a unity uh, regarding one question about the whole existence of the state. Good afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, big thanks for your continued focus uh, on, on the conference. Uh, um, um, I would like to start with saying that uh, Edwin really has shown a very deep understanding of uh, Ukrainian so society, so I will build uh, to a large extent on what, what he said. But I also want to say that, echoing uh, what you said at the beginning, that Putin agrees with you, because in his speech the, this morning he, spoke, he said that um, this is a war of the collective West uh, against, uh, against Russia. So we have to take seriously his, his words and uh, uh, act uh, accordingly. Now, so I, I also see uh, the future of uh, uh, Ukrainian democracy optimistically, not denying uh, things in your question uh, that war generally uh, 
require centralization of institutions. And in media, indeed, there has been, and, and in some others. But, uh, but I think Edwin's points are, are very uh, true. And I would also add that it's also important that uh, Ukraine is firmly anchoring itself in, in, in an international uh, uh, integration whose values are very democratic. And uh, there, there wouldn't be uh, even a chance if somebody wanted to, uh, to, to alter from, uh, from, uh, uh, from uh, uh, democratic uh, um, uh, processes. Um, actually, with, uh, with uh, uh, Mihailo uh, Vinitsky, and, uh, and, uh, who is a sociologist, an uh, outstanding uh, Ukrainian, uh, Canadian uh, sociologist living in, in Kiev, and, uh, and Vladimir Dubrovsky, we wrote uh, an analysis of the chances of reforms before the war. We finished it a, a, a bit uh, more than a year ago, and uh, and uh, uh, Mihailo already in in that uh, uh, book that he wrote uh, argued very strongly for uh, for a very very profound uh, change in in Ukrainian society that has happened continuously, but particularly triggered by by the events in 2013, uh, the revolution of dignity, and then of course. Uh, the Russian aggression in 2014 uh, against uh, Ukraine. Um, also, uh, I should say that as much as the Ukrainian business does have an oligarchic structure, but it has a pluralistic oligarchic structure, and I, I very strongly hope that actually after the war, again with the help of, uh, of, of this general international context, we will be able to get rid of the oligarchic character and, uh, and there's going to be a, a, a strong uh, future. As far as reconstruction is uh, concerned, and uh, Sofia uh, mentioned a few things, what I think here is very important, she mentioned very important data, uh, latest data uh, from a few days ago actually, about the level of destruction, what is going to be also very important that uh, the reconstruction again works in a way that is embedded in in reforms and that also is going to be a joint challenge to the Ukrainian society leadership but also of the international donors and uh, and all these sociological questions that have uh, come up are going to be important I just want to say one thing, that uh, there was an introduction of uh, myself, but uh, uh, acronyms were used, so I live in uh, Chisinau, in Moldova, I'm an EU uh, advisor to the government on the issues of Transnistrian conflict, and that is embedded in the title of uh, uh, high-level advisor on confidence building measures. And uh, in 2014-15, I established the, the EU uh, advisory mission in Ukraine. That is a very large uh, mission on uh, civilian security sector reform. So I may also uh, say a few words about Moldova if, uh, if, if it's uh, uh, going to be opportune in, in the given moment, particularly that in the morning we had a session on the Balkans and Eastern uh, partnership, but actually it was only about the Balkans, and uh, I, I feel my country, Moldova, being a bit uh, out of the picture. I, uh, uh, I really hope that uh, this fight, uh, this victorious fight against the oppressors uh, would uh, strengthen uh, the Western faith in uh, liberal democracies and in our values, because uh, in my opinion, uh, this is the uh, most heroic uh, story uh, since the Second World War in, in Europe. Uh, in the first days of uh, full-scale invasion, uh, when, when Volodymyr Zelensky uh, was uh, advised 
uh, to escape from Kiev, uh, he said, I need ammunition, uh, not right. And uh, I thought, uh, when, when I, when I uh, listened to this, this speech, that uh, this is uh, the, the, the coolest uh, speech from our politicians uh, since uh, Winston Churchill in 1940. But uh, this is not only uh, maybe the most heroic story, but uh, this is uh, the most brutal uh, story since the Second World War. Um, are there any estimates of uh, uh, what percentages of uh, Ukrainian national wealth uh, will be destroyed uh, for, for the end of the war? Maybe. But <laughs> do you expect a kind of uh, martial aid after the war from the Western countries? Uh, well, um, it's... Of course, we cannot answer the question of what will be destroyed in the future. Uh, um, as uh, Sofia quoted the latest estimates in terms of numbers, uh, the, again, the important thing is that first we have to sustain Ukraine until victory, both militarily and also in terms of state budget. Uh, Ukraine's need in budget support is about $5 billion per month. And it may sound a large number, but, uh, but given the nature of this war, Russia's war against uh, the collective West, it's, uh, it's a price that we should definitely pay. And when it comes to the uh, reconstruction, uh, repeating myself to some extent, uh, first of all, I th you know, Hungarians mostly know the book of Janos about the uh, reconstruction cycle. So countries after the war tend to uh, build back very quickly to, to the old uh, growth trend. So in that sense, we can be optimistic. Definitely we will need a well thought over coordinated international help, financial assistance, but again, what I said, embedded in a, in a vision, if you like, conditionality of how the reforms should go, that is also should be in a harmony with Ukraine's aim of quickly reaching the point, and you heard uh, the commissioner saying we help, but uh, the, uh, the conditionalities are, are iron uh, uh, hard, that, uh, but we have to uh, help in a way that both physical reconstruction and building EU-compatible, strong market-based institutions and rule of law-based institutions uh, be established. And uh, again, I'm very optimistic that it's, uh, it's uh, going to happen that way. Definitely, we are talking about uh, of, uh, as, as, as uh, uh, Sophia said, uh, uh, referring to the World Bank estimate, about hundreds of billions of uh, dollars. Again, here the numbers are less important than the outcome, which is a growth that leads to a very sustainable uh, uh, trajectory of Ukraine getting into the European Union. <laughs> um, speaking of Marshall Plan, like I think recently in July we had the Lugano conference where the issue of Marshall Plan got a bit like on a paper. It's not called Marshall Plan, it's uh, like Lugano declaration uh, on what are the priorities uh, the government presented the project and this, the thematic areas where the support is needed, calling international community to support and to contribute because the numbers are huge, the level of destruction is immense and uh, but the uh, yeah, we have this uh, Lugano declaration, where, what we have. Uh, also recently, German Marshall Fund, uh, they published their recommendations, how they see it, like how the recovery should go, and in their view, it's, uh, there should be like four stages, relief, reconstruction, modernization, and EU accession. Um, uh, so, like, we see the process is going. Another aspect was, 
I think in March and April when different states or capitals uh, were saying like we will be in charge of um, uh, recovery reconstruction of the city. So for example, if I'm not mistaken, I might be wrong with the, uh, with the countries. So Denmark said that they will be in charge of reconstructing uh, Mykolaiv region. Uh, Greece uh, said about the maternity hospital and the uh, uh, city as such of Mariupol. So we, we heard already these ideas of the reconstruction. I don't know how it will look in practice because, I mean, imagine that a state takes care, uh, says we're going to be in charge of certain region. I mean, like, it's great ambition and uh, it would be great to help with restoring the critical infrastructure at least because we have like lots of schools, uh, uh, sc hospitals and like cultural institutions and cultural heritage destroyed. This is one thing. Uh, but this requires lots of money and for example in lots of recommendations that we see uh, one of the key messages is we, we should plan recovery and reconstruction already now and not to wait until uh, the end of the war. And this is what we also see how our partners from civil society and also like how Ukrainian experts are now attending different meetings with the ministries and governments thinking about reconstruction or green recovery, all, uh, all of this. At the same time, the support is needed now. As Kalman uh, says, it's like, Every month we need money to sustain to sustain the state because the the economy is undermined. I mean, like if you have a shelling, then uh, the plant will not be working properly as it is, or if it is somewhere at the occupied territories. These are lots of economic uh, losses at the moment. And at the same time, along with economic losses, this is employment. People lose their jobs, and and they need to get jobs as soon as possible to keep the economy running. So we, we face the thing like, I think there, sh there will be for certainly something like Marshall Plan, but we, we don't know how it's going to be called, because we already talk about this, and we admit the scale of destruction is so big that we as a, one country, we will never handle this cost. And we try at this very day, every day, to keep the troops where they are, that they don't advance to the west, south, or wherever else. We take the cost, so this is where we need support, and that we, need, we will need it further on, and we sh it shouldn't be conditionality that we will support you in future. No, we need it now, and we will need it in future, because it costs a lot. The reconstruction is as much about the economics, uh, economy as about politics, and, and uh, of course, the most important thing now, uh, as was, uh, was said here, so is to win the war. So Ukraine, with the Ukraine, U Ukraine needs need support uh, now in terms of money for, for keeping budget in balance, then uh, in terms of military support, of course, that's obvious, and then political support in, in international relations. It's, it's also very, very important, not only in direct relations between Ukraine and, and Western countries, but uh, building support in uh, countries of Global South, because we know that Russia is very effective in selling its propaganda toward African or Latin American countries. So now we can see that the situation is a little bit changing. So last week, Samarkand summit showed that uh, Mr. Putin cannot count on, on the, his biggest, uh, let's say, allies like, like Narendra Modi, who told him that there is no, this is no time for war. So he was publicly reprimanded for what he's doing. So we can see that, that this activity, political activity on the international, um, let's say, scene is, is, is working uh, for, for, I would say, uh, toward uh, Ukraine. But uh, we can also see that even getting this five billion dollars per month is not so easy. So it's a very tough job for Ukrainian government to persuade uh, European, especially European politicians, to put this money on table. So, so it's it's uh, it's a very very difficult uh, task because of many reasons. So, so we can discuss them. But interesting point is Lugano conference and and and, and uh, this moment when Ukraine showed their vision of of the future and, and this uh, reconstruction effort. The, the works on this plan began in the 
in mid-March, so it was just three weeks after the, the war began. So I was uh, talking to, to some experts who were involved in this, this effort. It was really impressive and the plan showed there. So it was a couple of thousands of pages of, of, of uh, very uh, precise uh, projects and so on. And what happened? In politically nothing. So the reaction of West was very restricted, I would say. It was very interesting what Ursula von der Leyen said then in Lugano. She began her speech with references to Mr. Roman Ratushny, an activist who died in this war, but before the war he was fighting against corruption in, in Ukraine. So she sold a message that the West doesn't trust Ukrainian government still. So it was very, I would say, British uh, reaction to, 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 to aspiration of uh, Ukrainians and what was then her answer. So, we like your plans, but we will show ours in October when Mr. Scholz and me will organize our conference. And we are waiting for this conference, which will be held in October, as we know. So, we can see that there will be a real battlefield between Ukraine and the West uh, about the rules of, of the reconstruction because Ukrainians um, understand that it's not only about public support from international institutions or organizations like European Union. The most important is to provide security warranties to attract private capital, to inflow of private capital and technology, of course, because it's not only to reconstruct, but to modernize economy, to be adequate to the future needs. And this is the problem, because we can control public institutions, but private capital, it's, it's capitalist world, so we can expect that they try to, to, to do, uh, to, to, to get as much as possible. So how to balance uh, these different parts? So it's, it's a very important question. So how to avoid that Ukraine won't uh, become kind of a, Mm, subject to neo-colonial, uh, let's say, exploitation from the side of capital. So it's possible. So, so, it is, so, so we need to do as much as possible to avoid kind, this kind of scenarios because it is true, Ukraine will depend on foreign, uh, foreign aid and of course Ukrainians want to control this, the, the rules of this aid. So we could read this uh, philosophy in uh, Lugano plans that uh, it's very interesting, so I, it's not time to, to, to dig deeper in, in, in details, but, but I wanted to, to show that the stakes are very high, but, but uh, not so obvious, because everybody claims uh, that he or she wants to, 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 to support Ukrainian, but also everybody or a lot of people counts on future fruits which will grow on Ukrainian soils after, uh, soil after, after the, the reconstruction. So it's, it's really... Can you explain a little more this neo-colonial So simply, capital going some in our in investings want to, to get as much as, 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 uh, as can back. So Ukrainian and Ukrainian economy till now was a resource economy country. So based mostly on selling uh, not let's say, not, not um, how to say, uh, I, I'm missing the word, mm, but, but uh, well, yeah, so it was just, uh, Ukraine was selling rather uh, iron ore than uh, manufactured uh, um, uh, things, or the same was with grain. So it was, uh, the grain was the main, let's say, export product, not uh, um, products or, or alimentary products made of it. The, the stake is to change the situation, and uh, Julia Sfridenko was uh, talking about this, uh, Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of, of Economy, that the stake is to change the situation, to, 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 to make Ukrainian economy more value-added. And of course, this is the wish, but it's not, it doesn't mean that Western capital will have interest in doing so. Simply so. Now is how to, what kind of resources we can use to, let's say, move the, the power toward Ukrainians to negotiate the terms of trade, simply. So, so because uh, in the end of the day, th this will be about the bargaining 
of, of uh, not about uh, wishes. Yes, uh, trust is a crucial question. Uh, I agree with uh, Francis Fukuyama uh, that uh, our civilization is uh, based on trust. And uh, uh, without trust, uh, won't be support, financial support in the long run. So uh, I would like to ask uh, how we can uh, strengthen uh, the trust uh, in the Ukrainian government in the future. So uh, how international organizations and uh, Ukrainian civil, uh, civil organizations, NGOs, uh, can cooperate in the future in order to, to secure uh, that uh, a significant part of uh, this financial support uh, won't be, won't be stolen by, by local oligarchs. Um, I, I, might, I might start to uh, take it over because we, as a foundation, we work a lot with civil society organizations. And uh, for us, it's crucial that first and foremost, uh, we support this grassroots movement. And uh, I can't say it's something new that we, we ask for civil society to be involved into the process. It, it is de facto, like it's happening and the people are ready to get involved and they, they do, they go out to the streets, they go to the public hearings, etc. It's not something to be forced or asked, but what needs to be, it must become a kind of a requirement if we talk about reconstruction, about the recovery, providing any kind of a support that the civil society, the independent experts should be engaged into the process. After Lugano, there was also uh, like um, Lugano a statement from civil society asking, requiring that any funding that comes, any kind of a reconstruction project that will take place in Ukraine, it should require civil society to be engaged. That should be kind of a participatory process, but it shouldn't be participation as sort of a stage participation says, ticking the box, yeah, there wasn't one expert and this is it, but literally listening to the recommendations. We, we know quite often, this is what we've been doing for years, like we support that the, what if government doesn't have resources for some studies or like a special expertise, we are fine to support our experts, the civil society that we work with, that we rely on, that they do these studies and we just hand it over. We are fine to support them that they can come to the meetings and express the expertise because we have lots of expertise on the grounds and these people are not in the government but they are like in their NGOs because they have way more flexibility. Some, and we also saw it after 2014 when lots of civil society activists, they went and they joined, went into politics, they became either MPs or local deputies. That we see that the, like at some point this transformation is happening and the activists move to the level of politicians which which is also good because we know that the, the system is changing. It's getting like a bit a bit of a hybrid, but it's not an easy task. And if, if we talk about reconstruction and recovery, that should be an oblig like obligation and first requirement. This is not one person deciding. It should be consulted. It should be evidence-based. It should be considering the expertise of real experts dealing with the issues in order like to secure the different parties are looking at this. And especially if we talk about international funds coming, and uh, there should be like public council, public hearings, or at least like these discussions groups where we can present different points of view, and especially when it concerns development, building, uh, any, I mean like wh whatever would come for development and building new buildings, that would be a huge money. But the question is, are there, except of building a new house or whatever, do we think about public space, for instance? Do we think about accessibility? This, what quite often, like this independent sector can secure and to push that, that it follows the requirements, it follows the proper sm uh, spending, also calling for resources that will present the, how the money is spent, like the transparency of uh, fund spending. That's, that's quite a lot of work, but I think like this is, should be like one of the main requirements when we talk about reconstruction, recovery, and any kind of international aid. There should be civil society involved into the process. I fully agree that, that civic society is essential in this, this process. When we are talking about Lugano, it was 
uh, impressive plan of government, but uh, just together, civic society organizations presented their own plan. It was a manifesto, but then also the, a plan. So very kind of a complementary philosophy of, of recovery, exactly what, what, what you said. So, so the, the strength of civil society is really uh, great now, and after all, will be even, even bigger. So, so it's, it's very important force. And then, of course, local governments, which are also proving that, uh, that they are a very important part of the game during the war, and of course will be a very important part during the reconstruction. And, and uh, so, so this is another uh, part of, uh, of the game. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the next uh, issue is what Mr. Zelensky and, and the government will be doing in the next months. And it's not so obvious, because on the one hand, Mr. Zelensky tried to use the war situation to consolidate his power, because war, it's, it's quite normal. But the question is, we can go to the, your first question. Will this consolidation serve for democratic things or just for consolidation of power also after the war? The answer is not so uh, obvious, but we have another, so not direct, but a very promising answer that public debate in Ukraine is open. There is no censorship in, in spite that we have war. So, of course, this uh, official media working under, let's say, this platform, United News, are quite inclusive. So, for example, media of Mr. Poroshenko was excluded from, from this sphere. But other media, press, internet, is completely open. So you can read fascinating debate about uh, Mr. Zelensky, his mistakes, about, for example, about his uh, mm, interview he gave to Washington Post about uh, this information from U.S. intelligence about the, the, the coming war, why he did not, uh, let's say, prepare Ukrainians to this and so on. So this debate, why it was so and so on. So for me, this open public sphere with civic societies and local government, which are responsible for, for provision of uh, um, public services and so on, it's very important. It's part of a very complex system which makes uh, let's say, which makes or builds uh, infrastructure for trust into the institutions of the state. Um, not too much to add. Uh, I don't know if uh, any of you read a few days ago, the uh, Washington Post was running a, an article uh, about the uh, the beginnings of the war and the Russian mistakes. It was sent on the Russian mistakes, but there was something very interesting. Uh, first of all, they interviewed a number of people in the uh, special services, and uh, uh, they concluded, the, the article, it was a long article, uh, concluded that, uh, on the basis of what was said, that uh, Zelensky's uh, famous uh, saying at the beginning of the word that you also quoted, really had a material impact on the uh, internal services uh, on SBU, which admittedly at the beginning was both severely infiltrated by Russian uh, agents and was in many areas, uh, I used to work on their reform, uh, very, very corrupt. And uh, what I'm trying to say is that, first of all, I indeed, Zelensky's stance showed an example to the core of the one of the cores of the state, but also that uh, actually the situation with corruption improved in the internal services during the war. The, the challenges of the war had a self-cleaning uh, impact on, on some of the institutions. Other than that, uh, I would agree with, uh, with the call on transparency. I mean, one wish is we are also not perfect in the West, and what you've said about Lugano is not surprising to me, because we, um, I mean, we are having our slow-moving bureaucracies, and uh, indeed here, the good combination would be to be very generous for the future, because now we have to help on the go, but uh, for the future we should be very generous, but also to have very uh, strict uh, 
expectations in terms of the reforms and particularly transparency of the funds that will be spent because indeed these will be will have to be and hopefully will be huge funds uh, reconstruction funds so this is what i'm t trying to say from the beginning of this conversation so money physical reconstruction but embedded when it comes to post-war situation embedded into a strong expectation and realization of uh, of institutional reforms towards free markets and uh, and uh, rule of law institutions, and again transparency to be critical in all this. Now I uh, will turn to the audience uh, whether uh, we have any questions. Experts, yes. Uh. Hey, hello. Um, good afternoon. Um, Alex Stemp, um, Budapest Times. Thank you for most illuminating um, conversation this afternoon. Um, all this is what you're saying is, is great and it's fine and it's most um, respectful in terms of facts, figures, what to do now. But ultimately, what would be the assurance that something like this would never happen again? What would be the end game so that Russia won't attack and then we can rebuild houses, hospitals, return refugees back to their country? How, you know, with assurance that, you know, that, because if, if you put money into infrastructure now and they rebomb again, there's not much point. So, uh, um, you know, what would be the end game to, ass to, to assure that it's safe to move? I hope that's an okay question. That Russia runs out of missiles and gets out of the country and we return to 1991 borders? <laughs> uh, yeah. Ah, yeah, you know, I have wishful. I, I could wish for even more, but I'm not, I'm not sure I'm allowed to put it on the stage. But it, I've heard from some people that the, the way that it would, so that the possible way it would be like is if sort of Russia breaks up, like if Siberia broke up from Russia, then he really would have something to complain about, and that would make the Ukraine matter look rather kind of pointless and trivial. Because if he loses Siberia, that would probably be a bigger issue for him, because then his legacy really would go down. Um, the breakup of Russia into 20 smaller pieces would probably be another solution than, I don't know, just a thought, but, uh, um, but it has to resolve somehow. somehow. It should. I mean, Russia as a terrorist state should, yes. literally, it's not one person country, it's a system. And even if we, if there is one, like, if... Overall, this is a problem of a system. So it's not one person deciding, but it's also the system that's surrounding, who implements the decisions and implements the rules, who launches the, the missiles and shellings and whatever is happening, but it's also, I'm sorry, public support, which is silence. Silence is a support. Yeah. And this is like, it will take ages and then, I mean, until it doesn't collapse. But um, yeah, I, I, I know that, but I think not everyone in Russia is happy. I hear that people in the far east of Russia are very unhappy with, because all the money and all that goes to Moscow. They don't get anything. And they live in the, you know, the most furthest parts of the world and they receive very little. And um, two years ago when Belarus had their revolution, people from the far east of Russia, they were supporting Minsk. Do, do you remember that? So, so that was a very telling you know, um, chapter of uh, life in Russia today. Look, uh, so uh, Russia occupied at the highest point of occupation 20% of the country. Yes. Now, now a few percentage points in terms of territory have been retaken, but 80 plus percent is not occupied. There is yeah. risk, of course, bombing, but uh, that risk is different in different parts of the country and people assess it. Yeah. So they do invest, they do work, they, uh, you know, yeah. uh, Kiev is, uh, is, is living its life and many, Lviv is living it, and many other cities. I mean, people assess risks uh, on the go. As far as uh, Russia's war tactics are concerned, it, uh, you know, I'm coming from a country where uh, uh, there has been a ceasefire for 30 years today. 30 years. Uh, and uh, we, of course, live there, uh, also in the, uh, the Russian-occupied small territory of Transnistria. Yeah. There are investments, and uh, so people adjust to the situation whatever way the, the war goes, and people will invest, and the government will invest, and, 
you know, some investments may uh, be more risky than others, but uh, people live and want to live and want to reconstruct. And us, yeah. Okay. Just to add on this, uh, over the weekend I was in Chernihiv region. This is uh, the very north which was occupied. And we were driving across the villages, literally just taking the roads to see the real life, I mean, the the normal life that people are having, because now I'm based in Kyiv mostly, but that was like we took two days just to see, and people are living there. They were they were under occupation. They were having heavy yeah. human rights violations there, and like atrocities happening. Now we have September, and we see how people are preparing wood for winter because some will use some like a hard, uh, like how it's called. Um, uh, <laughs> okay, so it's uh, like, the ovens. Uh, the, sort of it, the ovens, because I mean, this is the village. But you see that people are doing uh, their fields, potatoes, all the stuff. People are living, and it's Chernihiv. They have Russia right there, and they were under occupation. And now, giving the question, shall we wait until Russia collapses and then support them? No, we need to support these people now because winter is coming. Most lots of houses are destroyed. I mean, if you like you don't have a roof and this is the elderly lady who has just a pension of 100 euros maximum and how for what cost will she get a new roof and this, which means like we need to invest and we need to support it already now because yeah. i mean some of the people will will not be able to go through winter in the end yeah, of the day and it's not a worry of a gas price it's a worry of literally whether you will have a dry Everything house else. or not yeah. i suggest to pick up the next question and yes sir. <clears throat> We have one in the second row. This lady also wanted to ask something. Can we have two? Yes, yes. You can sacrifice coffee break. Thank you. Um, um, Ralph Leonhard, I write for the uh, daily paper Die Tageszeitung in Berlin. Uh, my question is similar to the, the one of the colleague. Uh, most experts uh, forecast not a total military defeat uh, nor a formal uh, peace uh, agreement, but a frozen conflict. And how is, how is reconstruction going to work in a frozen conflict? And maybe, um, I don't know, uh, does the Moldovan government or Maya Sandu have a strategic plan for recovering Transnistria? Uh, Should I? You can start with Moldova and then we can take over. Well, um, I mean, on the, on the first question, uh, I think we can only repeat ourselves. There is life in every possible scenario, and we will uh, adjust. As far as uh, Moldova is concerned, uh, uh, of course, uh, we live in a situation where uh, in uh, our neighboring uh, friendly country there is a war. Uh, the Sandu government shows a great uh, sympathy to, to Ukraine and uh, allies with, uh, with uh, uh, the European uh, friends and uh, the United States in, in condemnation of, uh, of, of, uh, of the Russian atrocities and uh, uh, war. Uh, we, we do have a complex reliance on uh, which would be far, I mean, a full one hour uh, would be needed to explain uh, the whole energy uh, uh, nexus there. So, so we do still trade with Russia, I mean, we, Moldova. Um, uh, but, but we are very firmly uh, uh, on the side of, uh, of Ukraine. Uh, we treat the uh, security situation in, in the country, including in Transnistria, very cautiously. We take note of uh, the Transnistrian uh, separatist leaders' uh, desire to avoid uh, conflict that Krasnoselsky uh, expressed uh, several times. There is cooperation in, in, in many economic uh, areas. Uh, uh, in the way, and uh, the uh, deputy prime minister for whom I work uh, just uh, last week uh, suggested uh, uh, dialogues for a for a peace settlement that uh, the Transnistrian uh, uh, chief negotiator in two days declined. 
under what influences uh, he he wrote his uh, his uh, message i will not uh, comment publicly on but uh, but he declined uh, this offer but at the same time uh, there is an ongoing uh, uh, practical level uh, cooperation uh, and i think it's very important that we avoid uh, the escalation of the war into moldova's territory including the uh, transnistrian one and uh, to show uh, responsibility here i think that that uh, the, to freeze this conflict now is, is only in the interest of of uh, russia and everybody understand this so ukrainians never will never accept any kind of ceasefire or, or agreement which will keep the, the status quo uh, without uh, pushing uh, back uh, Russian forces out of the country. So it's obvious. Of course, it depends on the help of, of the Western countries, but we can see now the switching moods of, of leaders of uh, Western countries. So a couple of months ago, there was so Mr. Scholz and Mr. Macron who were saying that the Rus Russia had not didn't had how to say had to know had to lose the war, but they didn't say that Ukrainian was to win this war. But now they officially declare that Ukraine must regain their territories, and they are let's say, offering the support for 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 this war. Of course, this problem is uh, the problem is with Russia, and how to what will be with Russia, the earlier question, after the Ukrainian victory. So because there, there are many scenarios and of course uh, eventual uh, collapse of, of Russia after it is a threat for the whole world. Of course, this is a, a real risk. But uh, nobody was prepared for the, this war and uh, even more nobody was prepared for victory of Ukraine. But now it's not impossible as we Six months ago, nobody believed in this scenario. I would just say that if we freeze all of this, it, it's like we would keep a mine next to the entrance of our house, like demining the porch. And you will never know at which point this will explode. Like whether you will step today on this and the explosion will happen, or it will remain for ages. This is what happened. Uh, in 2014, 15, so we sort of saw, thought Minsk agreement, we, we've agreed on the front line, and now we have eight years after, we have bomb. It's even bigger, and the ambition of Russia is even bigger. And if we freeze now and agree, okay, this is the way it is. We don't know what will happen in a year, two, eight, ten years, whether Russia will doesn't want to say like, hey, we want to get Western Ukraine as well, or we want to have Kyiv, finally we want to get, no. We are, this is something what I personally I would say, like, this is like living having a bomb at night, next to my leg, and I don't know which, at which point it will explode or not. And Moldova. And Moldova. <laughs> we will share the bomb. I am really sorry, uh, we have to finish this discussion according to the program. And uh, we will talk about the memory policy maybe uh, the next occasion. And uh, we really hope uh, that uh, this war uh, will be end until it. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.